Um, today I will be talking about fairness in data labeling for machine learning. Um, I chose this topic because we have been talking about different um, topics about ethics and fairness in AI, but mostly we talk about the algorithms and about the benefits um, or limitations that we get in the machine learning applications, but we don't really talk about where the data comes from. And data labeling has actually evolved into a pretty big industry. Um, so uh, with its pros and cons, so I want to, to mention those today. And I will start by going, uh, giving a few examples of a few applications of what machine learning is doing for us nowadays, and then go into why we actually still need humans uh, to label all the data we need for machine learning, and then go on to give you a few use cases and examples of this data labeling industry. And then finally, um, go over the, the stakeholders and the current research that, that is being done in this area before we can open, open for discussion. All right, so let's have a, a short look at, at all the good things uh, machine learning has been doing for, for our society and how it has been improving the quality of many lives. So for example, uh, medical applications, um, cancer diagnostics are much more accurate and, and faster thanks to machine learning. Um, applications such as speech recognition and um, speech generation have been helping um, not only not only us normal people, but also uh, many people that have uh, certain uh, speech or language disabilities. Um, machine translation is also a very well-known application. You get an email in any language and uh, Google translate that for you. It might not be perfect, but you can at least get the gist of what, what the text is saying. Um, moreover, things like optical character recognition, if you write uh, with your pen on your tablet, it automatically recognizes your handwriting and produces nice text out of it. Um, and then also other things such as weather forecasting and traffic prediction um, are improving our lives every day um, and make us save a lot of, a lot of, a lot of time. Um, and then also things like like fraud detection, um, it's nice to know when you have weird charges on your credit card without even having to look out for them. Um, and the final uh, example I want to mention is um, environmental protection as well. Um, AI can tell us previously which areas are currently being deforested in the Amazon and, and um, lets us help faster. All right. So. All these applications are pretty pretty cool and um, and have some uh, pretty good benefits, but um, all these machine learning methods me need to be trained, and to be trained, uh, they need the humans to get all the labeled data from. So, why do we need labeled data for machine learning? The most um, commonly used uh, machine learning method is supervised learning. So for those who are not um, familiar with machine learning, supervised learning means that you learn statistical patterns from a lot of examples, actually from as many examples as you have available. So this means that the more example, the better your machine, lear machine learning method is going to get. But each example needs a label. So for example, um, for, for machine translation, you need to know what the correct sentence in other language is so that your machine learning method can learn it accurately. Or if you do, um, automatic object recognition from images, you need to know what somebody needs to tell them the method first, um, which objects are actually in the image so that, so that the method can learn. So where do all these pairs of examples and labels come from? Um, if you have a look at this image, you can see an example of data labeling for, for object recognition and image categorization. Um, so the task for, for the humans would be to mark all the, all the people in this picture, all the, the animals in these pictures, all the trees in these pictures and so on. And um, a human would sit there and actually mark boxes around all of these objects um, that they see in the picture. This would be an example of, of a labeling task. And the more of such examples your algorithm has, the better it is going to learn. And um, actually, as it turns out, the time allocated for, for data cleaning and data labeling tasks in machine learning projects is, um, takes up to 50% of the whole machine learning tasks. 
So training your model and finding the right model for your data is really a very small part of your machine learning project. But getting all the data that you need to train the model is one of the biggest parts. All right. So this means that there's a lot of data labeling going on out there because everybody's doing machine learning, all the big companies are doing machine learning, and they need more and more labels to build better and better models. So let's have a look at a few real world use cases um, of this industry. Uh, first, I want to shortly talk about YouTube. Um, Every, every minute, every day, many, many new videos are posted to YouTube. Um, but somebody has to actually go through these videos and check whether they, whether they contain content that we don't want to show to the, to the world, like violence, for example, or nudity. So even though um, YouTube is able to pre-flag some of these um, videos automatically, somebody still has to go through them and check. So imagine if you have a two hour long video and only one second of violence, this is still something that you want to detect so that you can take this video down. And um, YouTube actually has a lot of, um, of, of their own labelers, of their own employees that are doing this kind of task. Another example is Facebook. Um, there was a pretty controversial article in the Guardian um, a, few, a few years ago about how Facebook um, hires a lot of contractors and lets them um, label many examples that contain um, violence or graphic content. Um, and also these contractors have to label hate speech um, for, for many hours a day for, for barely minimum pay. Um, other companies that aren't as big as, as the biggest tech companies, um, such as eBay, they don't have their own in-house labelers, but they actually um, hire another company to, to get the labels of the data for them. So for example, um, you all know eBay, you can buy stuff on eBay and uh, their main website is actually a search site where you can, where you can search for, for the product that you want to buy. And um, so every month um, eBay gets a lot of new data labeled where they see um, for new product, for new trends, are the actual search uh, results that you get back from your queries, are they relevant? And um, instead of hiring they or the, their own employees, what they do is that they hire a company that specializes in data labeling and does it for them. Um, one of those um, companies is called iMerit. And um, our, I Married was portrayed in the New York Times a few months ago uh, with the headline, AI is learning from humans, many humans. Artificial intelligence is being taught by thousands of office workers around the world, and it is not exactly futuristic work. So as you can see um, on this picture, companies such as I Married um, are mostly, mostly based in India or the Philippines, and um, they actually hire office workers whose um, whose job it is to label data all day. This can be uh, many different tasks or not. It depends a lot um, on, on the company, um, but then you can hire these companies and they would label the data for you. And um, if we go even one step uh, further, there are all the crowdsourcing platforms where uh, these companies don't even hire their own workers anymore, but they have, um, they have a huge um, crowd available that does their tasks for them in just um, uh, small, small jobs and small tasks. So they're not actual full-time or part-time employees. Um, I think that well, the most well-known example is um, Amazon Mechanical Turk. And another very big one um, is Appen, which is, is based in Australia and is, is growing a lot these days. And, um, I want to shortly show you a video, which hopefully works, how um, Appen advertises for their careers as, as data labelers. Mm -hmm. Now we can see the screen of the browser. Yeah. Are you self-motivated and looking for a job that has great work-life balance? At Appen, we create jobs as unique as you and offer the flexibility to work when and where you want. Whether you want more time with your family to manage a business or to complete a degree, our flexible remote projects provide the opportunity to work on your own terms. Appen offers a different way to work, and for the past 20 years, we've partnered with some of the top tech companies working in over 130 countries and 180 languages. If you're wondering how this all works, it's simple. You apply online, and our team looks for projects that match your skills. 
from working with social media platforms to search engines. The work is interesting, and the remote flexible schedule allows you to create the life you want. Our freelancers span the globe and chart their own courses for work and life. Join the community and apply today. All right, so um, as as you could see, the main the main aspect that they that they advertise with is the flexibility that you have with um, if you take a job as, as a data labeler. So um, now after having looked at a few examples, let's look um, a bit more um, in detail about what these uh, workforce options are if you work in data labeling. So on one side, we have um, the very traditional uh, job options where you have your own full or part-time employees. And then um, there are more open options where you hire another company that manages the cloud workers for you, or you have contractors um, like we saw in the Facebook case. And then um, in the most, um, let's say open case, you have crowdsourcing platforms where you only submit your job to the platform and the platform um, takes care of finding workers, but you don't really know who they are, you just get your labels back. So on, on, if we go more towards the left, of course, uh, the employees have a higher context within the company as well. And uh, the labels are probably of better quality since um, the employees get training and um, get, are better informed um, about the tasks that they have to perform. Um, however, if we go more towards the left, there is higher flexibility in these jobs. And um, it's definitely also more about quantity because it's cheaper to get these labels. So if we have a look at the stakeholders in this data labeling industry, we actually have uh, three stakeholders. The first one are the data labeling platforms. Um, and then we have the job requesters, which would be one of these tech companies who needs data for their machine learning methods. Um, and then lastly, we have the workers uh, who need a job. So the job requesters need labels for their data and the workers need money. Um, and what the data labeling platforms do is that they provide work to the, to the workers and they provide the workers to the job requesters, which actually then um, indirectly the workers provide uh, labels directly to the, um, to the job requesters. So is this a perfect industry? Um, of course it is not, um, as you could also hear from the use cases. And um, there are many issues that one could highlight. Today I want to talk about two. The first one um, is the monetary aspect. Um, so one of the issues with these uh, data labeling platforms is that the market sets the prices. The data labeling platform doesn't give you any regulation whether or on how much you should charge for each image that you want uh, labeled, for instance. You can choose that yourself and that of course means that uh, the market sets the price and some of these tasks are actually um, pay one or two cents per, per label. Um, it also means that the salaries are equal worldwide. So the job requester decides to pay two cents per image and um, of course, in some, in some countries, two cents are worth a lot more than in other countries. And um, finally, um, there's the quantity versus quality issue. Of course, uh, if you have crowdsourcing workers labeling the data for you, you cannot be sure about the quality. You might have workers um, that are only spamming and so on. However, since it is so cheap to get labels, you can just get multiple labels for the same image uh, and you can just pay a little bit more and get a lot more labels. On the other hand, if we look at the, at the worker side, uh, we, um, we can see that one, one of the problems is the, the intellectual aspects of the, retire, of the required tasks. So of course, it's very, very boring if you have to sit there 12 hours a day labeling images and um, figuring out whether it's a cat or a dog on your image. Um, and on the other hand, there are also uh, the, the ethical issues with what if you have to label um, violence in videos or pornography or hate speech or anything that if you have to look at it for eight hours a day will definitely have um, some, some consequences um, on your psychological state as well. Um, and then finally, um, what comes from the worker side as well is that you have 
you you probably will have a bias you don't know where the workers where you get your labels um, are from uh, you don't know their their age group and so on um, unless you specifically ask for it so this also means that depending on the job you're requesting you will have a bias in your data set for instance if you only get labels from from a certain culture and so on um, so now let's have a quick look at, at what the research says. There is this uh, big study that was done by Harad al, um, two years ago, where they looked at almost 3,000 um, um, 3, uh, workers on, on Amazon Mechanical Turk, and they labeled roughly uh, 3 million uh, of, of images. And um, what they found out is that the median hourly wage is only $2 um, per hour and that only 4% of these 3,000 workers actually earn more than seven and a quarter dollars per hour. Um, the problem is that the average requester actually does pay more than $11 per hour, but there are so, so many more uh, lower paying requesters that post uh, much more work than the ones that actually pay well. So if you're if you're a worker, you will see and you will find on the platform many, many more jobs available that will only pay, uh, pay less money than the ones that are actually decently, play, decently paid. And then there are external um, factors that are not taken into account into these calculations. For example, um, when you request a job and you say you pay a few cents for each image, you actually don't take into account the time that is spent for searching for a new task, tasks that get rejected because the labels are not good enough or tasks that a worker is not able to finish and is not submitted. So all of this is of course lost time for the worker that is not being taken into account um, in these uh, wage calculations at all. Are there any solutions for this? They, there are a few proposed solutions, but um, the, of, of course they're, they're they are not yet um, um, perfect. So for example, um, in this paper by Barbosa and Chan, Chan from last year, what they tried to do is to, to route the task to workers based on, on their demographics, based on where they come from and based on, on their age, and to also route them by appropriate pay. Um, so the goal there is twofold. On one hand, they want to mitigate the biases that, um, that you actually will have in your data samples afterwards. And on the other hand, they want to increase the hourly pay that is given to the contributors by, by, um, by, by giving better tasks to, to more appropriate uh, workers. So if we, if we look at this, uh, at this graph on the right, this is a task of image categorization. So for instance, um, you have to label the animals um, or, or the people that you see on each image and um, you can see on the x-axis, um, the percent of the minimum hourly wage, uh, which is of course averaged over, over all the countries they looked at. And um, you can see that even when they implement um, these frameworks that should mitigate uh, these biases and actually um, give appropriate tasks and appropriate pay to the, to the, to the right workers, there is still a big gap uh, between the hourly wage and the actual minimum wage of the country. So finally, um, I want to shortly come back to this quantity versus quality issue and uh, mention a, a few more things. So many of the job requesters are just, um, since, since it is so cheap to post a job, what, what they think is that more workers give you better data, right? But actually, the more workers you have, the more, um, the more, the more energy and time you then have to spend into filtering out the many labels that you get and you have to implement outlier detection and so on. So, and on the other hand, um, there are also some aspects to mention when you're looking for quality in your labels. So for instance, of course, not all of the tasks are as easy as, as image categorization and for some of them, expert knowledge is needed. Um, and then there is also um, the aspect of task switching. So these data labeling platforms at the moment, they don't enforce um, their workers to take breaks or to switch between tasks because they don't really, as long as they get their labels and um, they get um, their commission, they don't really care how many hours a day you, you do your tasks and you label. 
Um, but of course, if this would be regulated to some extent, you, this would also improve the quality because the workers don't get um, that bored. And speaking about um, getting bored, there is also the intellectual challenge um, that workers have to deal with that, of course, this is not a, not a very interesting job to do um, for a long time. And that there is also a lot of work that gets rejected because the job requester thinks that you, you didn't uh, do a well enough job. They can just decide to reject your work without actually paying you. So to finish off and to start the discussion, uh, the question I want to ask you is, uh, which measures uh, should be should be um, enforced and uh, what can still be done to make the data labeling job actually a fair job opportunity. Um, all right, so thanks for listening and um, if you're interested, I have all the sources on the last two slides.